The night before, Sung Hoon had advised Da Gun to make a strong impression at school when he took charge of the second graders. However, Da Gun felt uncertain, disappointing Sung Hoon, who expected him to follow the usual pattern. What Sung Hoon meant by the cliche was like the typical scenario where a new student suddenly appears and starts dominating the classes. This student usually engages in a hierarchy struggle, aiming to become the leader. To assert and display dominance, all he needs to do is showcase his strength, much like how male lions flaunt their manes or gorillas act imposingly. It's an instinctive behavior in males to flaunt their status as a leader. However, Sum Hoon found it odd that, even though Dae Gun was on his way to becoming a leader, he wasn't flaunting his full power. He observed how Dae Gun matched the opponent's level during play instead of showing off. Sung Hoon realized that Dae Gun's goal wasn't just about asserting leadership. Dae Gun seemed surprised when Sung Hoon started talking about theories like in comics and even hinted at being a spy. In response, Dae Gun tapped Sung Hoon's shoulder and asked him to keep it brief. Sung Hoon picked up on Dae Gun's reaction but assured him that he wouldn't pry further. He simply wanted to connect with Dae Gun to tackle and control the bullies. Sung Hoon then requested Dae Gun's phone notepad and began typing something a list of second graders that Dae Gun planned to confront. Sung Hoon proposed finishing off the second grade group in one day. Back in the present, Dae Gun instructed Gong Nang to enter the classroom. Gong Nang argued that as a senior, it was his duty to expel the supposed evil spirit from his junior. Using this reasoning, he commanded others to attack Dae Gun. In an act of mercy, he ordered them to beat him up. Dae Gun, quick on his feet, grabbed his former monsieur and used him as a shield. He counterattacked with a powerful body blow, causing one student to fall and obstruct the others. Taking advantage of the distraction, Dae Gun knocked out the disoriented ones. Gong Meng scolded them for lining up and commanded them to climb onto the desks. Dae Gun kicked the tables, causing the bullies to fall. Seizing the opportunity, he delivered a punch. Gong Meng, astonished, ordered the others to use a different door. However, as they entered, Dae Gun sent them flying with a single heavy punch. He grabbed one as a shield against another bully who was preparing to throw a chair. A friendly fire incident occurred, and Dae Gun incapacitated the second bully. More members of the same group arrived, but Dae Gun easily dispatched them with his punches and kicks. Gong Min marveled at Dae Gun's strength, questioning if the term strong was sufficient for someone like him. Despite being outnumbered and surrounded, Dae Gun skillfully manipulated the surroundings to create one-on-one -on -one situations. Gong Myung, realizing that an audience had gathered, felt that it would be shameful for second graders to be defeated by a first grader. He took a step forward, pulling something from his pocket. Meanwhile, Da Gun's crew got wind of Da Gun's situation. Min Su overheard their plans to assist their leader and, of course, went to keep an eye on Da Gun. On the other hand, Suzy was wondering why Jin Mo was quietly studying. Jin Mo explained that it would be mutiny to interfere with second graders but Suzy still convinced him to help Da Gun. Back on the second grader's floor, a heap of bullies lay unconscious. Gong Meng shivered as he faced something resembling an azure. He rubbed his eyes and saw Da Gun suddenly in front of him. Wondering who Da Gun was to have the upper hand, Gong Meng asked, but Da Gun didn't understand and threw a punch at his face. Gong Meng was sent flying, witnessed by everyone. Man Ho and the others arrived to find that the situation had been resolved. Dae Gun checked his phone and realized Jawak was still missing. He regretted knocking out Gong Myung and hoped Jawak would arrive soon. Sun Hoon had also arrived and noticed the three subordinates. Suzy then pushed them aside, and Sung Hoon questioned why she was there. It dawned on him that Suzy had a current interest in Dae Gun. Man Ho, on the other hand, wondered about Min Su's whereabouts and found him next to a teacher. The teacher then spotted Dae Gun and pulled him into the teacher's office reprimanding him for standing up to his bullies. While eavesdropping, Min Su pondered why Dae Gun seemed so hurried. Min Su cleverly utilized the teacher to defuse the situation and gain time for the project by reaching out to Director Lee. Just then, someone walked by, and it turned out to be the school's chairman. He began questioning Dae Gun about his studies, and the teacher noticed their acquaintance. The chairman requested a private conversation with the teacher and had him rest his head on a fake grass surface in the chairman's office, turning it into an improvised hole for a mini golf game. The chairman instructed the teacher to treat Dae Gun better. As the two adults discussed matters, Dae Gun pondered the ethics of the situation. Eventually, Dae Gun and the chairman were left alone, marking their first meeting since the project discussion. Meanwhile, Jawak discovered Gong Myung and the others, 
who were all battered. He wondered what had happened, and suddenly, Samuel appeared, explaining that Dagon was responsible for the assault. Jawak informed Samuel that he had witnessed Baik Suyuk's execution. Samuel, concerned about a potential spy, questioned whether someone among them had leaked information to Dagon. Jawak then left after expressing some idiomatic sentiments. Back in the chairman's office, the chairman revealed that the bully in charge project was Director Lee's idea. Although he initially found it childish, he admitted it sounded entertaining. The chairman admitted almost forgetting about the project due to a lack of progress. He advised Dad Gunn to prove his worth in any way possible and even suggested dealing with the bullies by eliminating them. Dad Gunn expressed concern about property damage, but the chairman reassured him not to worry, revealing that he owned the school. This revelation didn't sit well with two individuals in the room. In class one-to-one, -one, Jong Min and Ho Jung were being noisy as usual. Man Ho told them to stop fighting and Jong Min went to buy some food. However, Jo Wok blocked his way at the door. Jo Wok punched Jong Min, grabbed his head, and threw him aside. Man Ho and Ho Jung picked out weapons, and Jo Wok claimed it was karma for Da Gun. As a monk, he wanted them to achieve Buddhahood. Ho Jung was unsure what to do, and Man Ho advised him to do what they could. They charged to attack, thinking Jawak, being big, would be slow. However, Jawak swiftly passed by and tackled Ho Jung. Man Ho attacked with a wooden sword, but it had no effect. Jawak called him silly for not knowing about an adamant body. Man Ho tried to say something silently to Ho Jung. Jawak noticed, but Ho Jung was still unconscious. Man Ho attempted to attack Jawak's sensitive part, but Jawak quickly closed his thighs to protect himself. Jawak claimed he knew Man Ho's trick and threw a punch at his face. As Man Ho was sent flying, Ho Jung got up to attack with a brass knuckle. Jawak held his wooden beads and fought back using them like a brass knuckle. Ho Jung was overpowered and got trashed with a hammer fist. Jawak said Dae Gun's karma would affect those around him. Seeing Jawak approaching, Man Ho knew he might die. Suddenly, Juri appeared out of nowhere. Jawak thought Juri was also related to Dae Gun and clenched his fist. Man Ho then told Juri to run. Suddenly, Juri disappeared from sight, narrowly avoiding Jawak's punch. Dae Gun rushed in to rescue her and exchanged greetings with Jawak. After checking on Juri's well being, Jawak approached Dae Gun, declaring his intention to send him to hell once his crew was defeated. The news of the ongoing fight spread quickly. Dae Gun argued that Jawak's crew deserved the beating they got since they continued collecting money despite his warning. From the doorway, Man Ho warned Dae Gun about Jawak's abnormal strength and speed. Dagon, puzzled by Manho lying on the floor, inquired about it. Manho sighed, explained that he couldn't move his legs, likening it to Ed Sheeran's song. Dagon acknowledged Jawak's different aura, realizing he was in his element. Jawak, claiming that his asceticism taught him forgiveness but witnessing his friends being beaten changed his stance. He vowed to be merciless towards Dagon. As Dagon wondered if Jawak was truly immersed, a moment later, a gun appeared and was aimed at Jawak, sending him flying. Juri warned that Jawak wouldn't be safe after taking such a hit. Meanwhile, Suzy persistently questioned Jin Mo about Dagun's latest fight. Jin Mo corrected her, stating it was Jawak this time, leading to Suzy's despair. She recalled a past incident where Jawak avenged his crew by defeating all the rankers from another school by himself. Suzy pondered how to stop him. Jin Mo offered a ride, and they headed off to see Dagun. Meanwhile, Juri was surprised that Jawak seemed unharmed. Jawak experienced the same powerful blow that Dojin couldn't withstand, but Jawak insisted it didn't affect him. He even claimed to have a special blessing from Buddha, ensuring his safety. While the onlooker pondered who might emerge victorious, Suzy shoved him aside and found Dagun and Jawak engaged in a final battle. Just as Jongmin attempted a sneak attack, Jawak yelled at him to halt. Jongmin narrowly stopped his brass knuckle just before hitting Jawak's sensitive area. Jawak dismissed Jongmin as insignificant, stating he didn't have the time to deal with him, as they would all soon face the same fate as Dagun. Jawak had employed a move called Flash Steps, swiftly attacking Dagun like an enraged bull with the speed of a cheetah. Despite Jawak's quick moves, Dagun managed to dodge his punches. In response, Dagun unleashed a barrage of punches resembling a machine gun, and Jawak struggled to endure the onslaught. Seizing an opportunity, Dagon aimed for Jawak's head, delivering a punch akin to a sniper rifle. Undeterred, Jawak claimed he wouldn't be hurt and fought back. Dagon, however, seized another chance and delivered a powerful body blow. 
Despite Jawak's attempts to counter, he continued to miss his punches. Dagun then executed a punch resembling a shotgun. The onlookers, particularly a nerd named Sung Hoon, started referring to Dagun's techniques as guns, in line with his name. Sung Hoon, however, disagreed, seeing something different. According to him, what Dagun was employing resembled a pile bunker. Even a tough body like Adamant proved useless against the penetrating power of this pile bunker. Eventually, Jawak knelt to the floor, prompting Dagun to seek blessings. Offended, Jawak retaliated by using another monk technique called Buddha Palm. Dagun, finding it ridiculous, grabbed Jawak's arm and broke it with a knee kick. Recognizing Jawak's fake monk concept, Dagun suggested seeking more blessings, as more beatings seemed inevitable. Meanwhile, at the bully's hideout, Sung Hoon informed the other members that the plan had worked. They were upset because they missed seeing Jawak getting beaten up. Then they talked about getting the rest of the group together and making them hold something harmful. Back in school, Jawak used to receive punches from every direction. Everyone was amazed, but Susie in particular was surprised that someone as tough as Jawak couldn't even budge. Jawak kept reminding himself about his dreams and goals. He questioned his own identity, realizing he was the only son of a wealthy family, having everything he desired. One day, he became irritated after finding hair clogging the toilet and blamed the cleaners. While drying his hair, he noticed them falling out. Anxious, he approached his father. When he saw his father's shiny bald head, he realized that even a perfectionist like his dad had flaws. His gold watch didn't sparkle. Instead, it was his balding spot that caught everyone's attention. He thought he could fix the issue with hair implants, believing that his wealthy father would easily cover the cost. To his surprise, he discovered that their fortune had vanished, leaving Jawak with nothing. It felt like a descent into hell. During this tough period, Buddhism became his source of strength. Shaving his head symbolized a commitment to non-possession, bringing some peace of mind. However, the sight of a fully-leaved tree still bothered him as he struggled to let go of his desire for wealth. Jawak enrolled in Jurian High, where he hoped to make money through fighting. Dominating the school in a year, he amassed wealth using cunning strategies. Eagerly anticipating the day he could reclaim his riches, Jawak's dreams were crushed by the relentless fists of Dagun. Jawak glared at Dagun and tackled him. He said that if he collected more, things would be over. He pushed Dagun like a bulldozer, but Dagun easily threw him aside. Dagun was impressed that Jawak still had strength and the monk corrected him that it was overflowing. Dagun advised him not to be reckless and return the money he collected, as he also believed in showing mercy. As he tried to say something more, Hojin woke up and Gong Myung arrived. They could see that Jawak achieved nirvana. Jawak claimed he would show what Buddha's blessing was and use a technique called Thousand Hands. Dagun quickly dodged and realized that Jawak didn't realize he was immersed. Gong Myung then explained the move and exclaimed that it would be all over for Dagun. Suzy thought Gong Myung was seriously mental, as all she could see was Jawak quickly swinging his fists. Jawak used to throw fast punches, but Dagun could always dodge them. While teaching Buddhism scripts, Jawak called others foolish, emphasizing that learning non-possession through collecting would help him afford his implants. However, his true intentions slipped out during the conversation. Gong Myung was surprised when they discussed shaving their heads as a symbol of agony. Dagun finally heard about Jawak's greediness and realized that greedy people end up losing their hair. Annoyed, Jawak threw a punch that felt powerful, but Dagun saw it as just a shell and countered with his own punch. Despite Jawak claiming to have 999 more fists, Dagun insisted a person should only have two hands. In frustration, Jawak tried to wake up Dagun using his bare fists. However, Jawak's greediness was exposed, and he faced the consequences. Attempting to fight back with Buddha's blessings, Jawak failed as Buddha bounced away, leading Dagun to slam Jawak's head into the ground. The shocking outcome of the fight left everyone in disbelief, with Jawak's head even emitting some smoke. Sung Hoon then contacted Samuel, stating that the second graders were now over. With the third graders absent, Dagun became the strongest person in the school. Sung Hoon planned to use Suzy to call out her brother, Su Yak. Suzy had fallen head over heels for Dagun. Other girls were also swooning over Dagun and his muscles. Suzy even warned them to stay away and keep him for herself. Dagun made her feel nervous in various ways. Shortly after, Sung Hoon joined the Middle Road gang, but Samuel was disgusted by it. It turned out that Sung Hoon was a spy and informed Samuel that he had already contacted the Holy Ancestry gang, another group. 
Sanwil asked about reaching out to Bak Suhyuk, and Sung Hoon assured him it would be easy. During their conversation, Sung Hoon mentioned that Suzy liked Da Gun, leaving Sanwil curious about the meaning behind it. Sung Hoon then explained the current tension between Bongin Vocational High and Jumryeon High. The two schools used to be rivals, but the situation changed unexpectedly. An organization affiliated with Bongin Vocational High vanished after Bak Suhyuk and his four executives took them down. The incident occurred because one of the organization's members had developed an obsession with Suzy, leading to stalking. Since then, Bonjin Vocational High stopped bothering Jimryong High. Samuel suggested making Dagun court Suzy, but Sung Hoon found the idea cute and laughed it off. He insisted that they needed a trigger for Dagun to visit Suzy's house. Samuel thought the plan could work, but Sung Hoon corrected him, saying it would only be effective if Dagun entered Suzy's room. After the first graders took control from the second graders in a school incident, the whole school atmosphere changed suddenly. Jongmin and Hojung, for some reason, always got special treatment in the cafeteria line. The news spread to all parts of the region, and other schools started talking negatively about Jumryong. Hojung and Jongmin later informed Manho about Dagun's influence. Dagun, curious about Hojung's excitement, called him over. Jongmin mentioned that the gangs hadn't been seen since the incident. Hojung suggested they were afraid of Dagun. Dagun thought that would be great, as it would allow him to focus on his studies. Out of curiosity, Manho asked Dagun about Suyok, wondering if he was the person Dagun was aiming for. Jongin said Suyok wasn't around, and only Suzy knew where he was. Suddenly, Sung Hoon appeared in front of them. He suggested getting close to Suzy to find out about Suyok, but the boys hesitated because Suzy was the school's self proclaimed queen. Jongin thought she was close to Jury, but Jury denied it. Then, Sung Hoon proposed a rooftop barbecue party to celebrate Dae Gun's leadership. Manho liked the idea, thinking about the delicious meat. However, Dae Gun didn't want to go. Ho Jung brought up alcohol and Dae Gun gave him a stern look. Alcohol had been Dae Gun's only companion when he worked as a part-timer. The fake student was excited, imagining meat and alcohol together. Sung Hoon noticed something and said they couldn't drink since they were still students. Eventually, Dae Gun agreed. Despite Jongmin reminding Juri about her training, she expressed her desire to go. Jongmin wondered if they should invite Suzy, and Sung Hoon assured them he would take care of it. That night, the gang gathered on a rooftop to celebrate Sung Hoon's excellent choice of location. Dae Gun felt let down because there was no alcohol. Ji Yin's friend, Era, unexpectedly joined them at Sung Hoon's invitation. While the rest were busy grilling meat, Dae Gun spotted a bottle of alcohol. The girls then playfully competed to feed Da Gun. Jong Min brought up Suzy's possible attendance, and Sung Hoon assured them she'd be there soon. Suzy arrived in casual attire, declaring her presence as the queen of the party. Jong Min questioned how Sung Hoon convinced her to come. The next morning, Sung Hoon overheard Era talking about how Da Gun escorted her home safely. He later approached Suzy and informed her about the barbecue party. Despite Suzy initially acting disinterested, Sung Hoon mentioned that his classmate, Era, would also be there. Suzy questioned why a random girl was joining, and Sung Hoon explained that Era had a liking for Da Gun. He further persuaded Suzy by suggesting that Era could help Da Gun with his English learning. Eventually, Suzy agreed to attend. As Suzy approached the group, she saw that two girls were already sitting on both sides of Da Gun. Suzy had no choice but to sit next to Sung Hoon and in front of Era, who quickly introduced herself. Suzy, wanting to assert herself, claimed to be the superior one. Jury then noticed that Suzy had brought something with her, a book. Suzy said it was an English book because she was studying. While the girls were discussing English, Sung Hoon said he would go get drinks. He thought it would be boring to have a regular drink, so he mixed one cup with eight different drinks. Everyone cheered for their new leader, but Dae Gun told him to stop calling him that way. Everyone drank their mixed drinks, and Dae Gun felt disappointed that it was just a normal beverage. People started claiming they got the regular drink until Jury noticed something strange. Suzy was acting weird all of a sudden. Suzy claimed it was hot and randomly punched Sung Hoon. She started taking off her jacket, revealing her tight shirt. Then she called out to Dae Gun and seductively asked him to sit next to her. Dae Gun sensed trouble and tried to ignore her. Sung Hoon noticed that Suzy had gotten drunk and texted someone. The gang had their party on the Holy Ancestry Gang's rooftop. Someone received Sung Hoon's message and ordered his gang to move. 
Jerry scolded Susie for suddenly flirting with Dagon, but Susie didn't care and continued inviting Dagon. Hera tried to pour drinks for her, but Susie lashed out at her. Susie wondered if Dagon liked someone like Hera, who was good at studying. She insisted that she was also good in English, and started naming jiu-jitsu techniques. Hera protested that Susie was not reading the book, but Susie insisted that she was also great at jiu-jitsu. She invited Dagon to a match and was confident in winning against him, and the loser would be the winner's slave. Jury's patience ran out, and the boys watched the two fight. Meanwhile, Jae Yin had been quietly investigating the chairman's recent actions. Min Su eventually discovered her when he heard some noise from a listening device. He wondered whether he should report this to his direct supervisor. On the rooftop, accusations were thrown at Jury for supposedly causing Susie to faint. However, Susie was merely asleep, having consumed too much alcohol. Many remembered Sung Hoon mixing something in the drinks. Unfortunately, the person with the glasses had disappeared and was blocking their way out. Dagon discovered an alcohol bottle and planned to start a party. However, he changed his mind and decided to take Susie home first. When he asked about her address, Jury offered to accompany Susie instead. Despite concerns from the boys, Jury insisted that it would be risky to leave Susie in their care. At that moment, Jury saw some classmates blocking the exit. The leader extended a helping hand to Susie. Manho wondered why Jury had suddenly stopped. The gang chose to leave Susie and Jury alone, heading to confront the boys instead. They then noticed Dagon, who appeared fine despite their assumption that he would be drunk. Dagon asked why they had come to ruin the party. Realizing Dagon was sober, the gang couldn't help but curse at Sung Hoon. Jongmin, upon hearing them, suspected that Sung Hoon was genuinely suspicious. They were then advised to target their leader in the upcoming fight, using tactics such as outnumbering, betrayal, or weapons. Manho agreed, suggesting the use of weapons. He pulled out a baton, warning them to be ready for retaliation if they initiated an attack. Manho singled out the green-haired guy, who revealed an expensive-looking metal bat that turned out to be stolen. Manho claimed he would use it effectively afterward and threw a piece of meat toward the green-haired guy, causing him to get angry. Manho challenged him to a fight, proposing to wager their weapons. The green-haired guy, angered, instructed his allies to deal with Dagon while he faced off against Manho. The leader had reminded his members to be cautious around Dagon, emphasizing that they shouldn't see him as just a regular person. Dagon, finding the group talkative, requested the other boys to look out for the girls. Hoping they were not very smart to focus solely on him, Dagon was determined. Following this, the leader instructed his members to attack Dagon. But he calmly informed them they had underestimated him, emphasizing that his strength varied with the circumstances. Dismissing his claim as a bluff, they warned him about their large group armed with more than 10 weapons. However, Dagon remained unfazed. He focused on their faces and swiftly threw punches, knocking them out one by one. Dagon explained that they wouldn't be able to effectively use their weapons if they stayed together. Undeterred, he proceeded to overpower the gang members, using his fists to take them down despite their armed resistance. The leader was surprised when he saw his team members flying, and the guy with green hair was getting really mad at Manho, who skillfully dodged his attacks. Manho remained calm and mentioned that he had already figured things out. The green-haired guy thought it was because of his movements, but Manho corrected him, saying he was checking if the bat was genuine. After a product test, Manho confirmed it was indeed genuine. This made the green-haired guy even angrier, and he swung his bat forcefully. However, Manho suddenly disappeared and reappeared from the side, surprising the green-haired guy and attacked him with his baton. The green-haired guy groaned in pain and tried to counterattack, but Manho vanished again. Manho then struck from the left side. The green-haired man realized he couldn't see well on his left side because his lens got stained by raw meat. Frustrated, he called Manho a coward for using such tricks and attempted to attack with fury. Manho took a stance and executed a three-stage attack with a baton, aiming for the head, chest, and stomach. Unexpectedly, the green-haired man felt the third strike not on his stomach but on his family jewels. Manho, it turned out, was indeed the master of unexpected moves. Meanwhile, the leader had spotted Suzy and Jury. He attempted to attack them with the intention of making them his hostages. Jury, noticing his approach, kicked him and scornfully labeled him as pathetic. Seizing his collar, she effortlessly flipped him to the ground. Jury couldn't believe that she was perceived as weak simply because she was a girl. 
Despite the discomfort, she decided to assist Dagun. The imposter gang leader, indifferent to Jury's intervention, turned his attention to attacking Susie. Unconcerned, he swung his wooden sword. In response, Jury stepped in to block the attack, visibly enduring the pain on her wrist. The leader mockingly commented on their friendship, finding it cute. Meanwhile, Manho had acquired the metal bat. Thinking about assisting Daegun next, a random slipper flew toward Ura. Manho used the bat to defend her. He felt relieved that she was fine and the bat proved effective. Manho instantly gained an admirer. On the other hand, Daegun continued defeating the other gang members until someone ordered him to stop. It was the gang's acting leader, holding Jury as a hostage. He threatened Jury to talk arrogantly again. As he continued acting mighty, someone crushed his hand, causing the box cutter he held to fall. Some Hoon appeared, claiming they had crossed the line. He mentioned analyzing the situation and concluded that it was not them. Confused, Dagun smacked the last gang member he was holding and asked Sung Hoon for an explanation. Worried, Sung Hoon asked Dagun to calm down and confess that he was related to the Holy Ancestor gang, apologizing for not telling him earlier. As Jong Hoon attempted to curse him out, Sung Hoon asked to hear his explanation first. He confessed to teaming up with the Holy Ancestry gang and trying to make Daegun drunk, but Susie ended up getting the alcoholic drink. Daegun claimed he couldn't trust Sung Hoon anymore after seeing how things unfolded. Sung Hoon stated he had no choice but to deceive them first and promised not to do the same in the future. Daegun then helped Jury get up, and she started kicking the gang leader. Daegun was glad that things ended well but warned Sung Hoon that if he lied again, he would treat him like the beaten students. Manho told Jury to go to the hospital since her wrist was hurt. He wanted to take over to test his new baseball bat. Sun Hoon checked for casualties, and only Susie passed out from being drunk. He asked Dagun to bring her home. Dagun casually carried Susie in his arms and asked for her address. Jury, looking jealous, tried to offer to send Susie home, but Dagun reminded her about her injury. The other boys tried to help, but Jury refused. Sung Hoon then urged Daegun to hurry up and provided Susie's address. Sung Hoon apologized for what happened, and Daegun told him to wrap things up upstairs. At that moment, someone rushed in urgently, calling out for Susie. It was Jizuk who had heard from Sung Hoon that Susie had gotten drunk. Jizuk attempted to escort Susie, but Sung Hoon intervened, instructing Daegun to proceed without them. While Sung Hoon appreciated Jizuk's information, he felt Jizuk's assistance was no longer necessary. Despite Jizuk insisting he knew Susie's habits, Sung Hoon urged him to head home due to not feeling well. Jizuk argued that he was fine, but suddenly, Sung Hoon kicked him, causing Jizuk to fall to the ground. Sung Hoon then claimed that Jizuk's leg was injured and reassured him that Daegun would take Susie home. Sung Hoon pondered what might unfold between the two, suspecting Jizuk of being jealous. However, Jizu clarified that he was merely concerned because Susie tended to use jujitsu unexpectedly when intoxicated, anticipating potential trouble. Shortly after, Susie found herself being carried by Daegun like a princess. Seeing Daegun's handsome face up close shocked her, and she wondered if she was dreaming. Worried about attracting too much attention, Daegun decided to hail a taxi. However, Susie, in a drunken state, began expressing that she didn't feel well and might throw up in the taxi. Dagon questioned whether Susie was awake, but she continued to feign sleep. Dagon, not wanting to risk a messy situation in the taxi, declined the ride. Whether it was a dream or reality, Susie simply wanted to be carried by Dagon. With no other option, Dagon activated his immersion, and his legs propelled him forward, surpassing the taxi that had left just a minute ago. The taxi driver, feeling challenged, accelerated and shifted gears. Despite claiming to be a seasoned bullet taxi driver for 20 years, he ended up crashing into a pole and was taken to the hospital. In the same hospital, Minsu noticed a familiar name in one of the rooms, Seo Juan. Inside, Jiang was sharing stories with her brother about Era and Da Gun. Minsu overheard Jiang mentioning Era's feelings for Da Gun, recognized Jiang's voice, and connected the dots to the moment he discovered Jiang in the chairman's office. Attempting to contact his supervisor, Min Su looked anxious, and Jingin, coming out of the room, noticing his distress. Meanwhile, Dagun had finally reached Susie's address. Upon entering the gate, someone recorded Dagun. Once inside, he realized there was no one around. When he approached Susie, he found her still acting drunk and unwell. 
With no other option, Dagon had to bring Susie to her room and couldn't believe she got drunk after just one glass of alcohol. As he attempted to leave the room, Susie grabbed his collar. She then climbed on top of Dagon, leaving him puzzled about her actions. Susie explained that she was going to demonstrate some jujitsu, as she had mentioned earlier. She even reminded him that the loser would become the winner's slave. Dagon had refused to engage in jujitsu or be subjugated like a slave. Susie, however, was determined to assert her dominance. The technique known as neon belly, applied by Susie, exerted pressure on her opponent's stomach. Susie insisted it should be painful, and the only way to escape was to overpower her. In an attempt to swiftly end the confrontation, Dagon seized Susie's right knee and left thigh. Yet Susie skillfully pulled him down, surprised that Dagon had some knowledge. She declared it made it easier for her to attack him. Dagon, realizing he had underestimated Susie, felt the strength of her grip. Despite their close proximity, Dagon had his own set of moves. Suddenly, he lifted his abdomen, employing the bridge technique. This move utilized core strength to dislodge the opponent and create space. Dagon's dedicated core training made his strength superior to that of ordinary individuals. Susie, taken aback by Dagon's unexpected strength, provided him with an opportunity to widen the gap. Sensing this, Dagon exploited the mistake. Susie, in tightening her hug, lacked surface support and easily lost her balance. Dagon executed a sweep, turning the tables on their positions, and confidently declared his victory. Meanwhile, in the hospital, Minsu said it was just a chance meeting with Jinian. He made up a story about his father having had breast cancer and left. It was a strange excuse. Minsu then called Director Lee and told her that Jian was targeting the chairman, possibly undercover. Director Lee got the information and hung up. The chairman advised her to leave work, as he had plans with CEO Park. CEO Park questioned if Director Lee was taking care of him, but the chairman just laughed it off. He assured CEO Park that he was about to witness something amazing. Suddenly, a guard warned them about restricted access at the entrance, but the chairman told CEO Park not to worry. They were granted entry, and CEO Park questioned if he had to do anything significant. The chairman explained that this was an opportunity for CEO Park to broaden his experience, claiming that the place held exclusive content for chosen individuals. As they walked, they encountered two men fighting and guards intervened to stop them. The chairman clarified to CEO Park that it was just an appetizer. CEO Park was curious about a door in front of them, and the chairman explained that it was the waiting room for his players. The door opened slowly, revealing a fearsome sight. Shocked, CEO Park fell to the ground, and a student named Ham Sunjin helped him up. Sunjin, a well-known errand boy from the third grade, bid them farewell since the chairman and CEO Park were heading to meet someone. The chairman reminded CEO Park that the next player was a student from their school. Sunjin entered the waiting room and greeted Soyok, who was shirtless in the dimly lit room. The chairman met CEO Kim at that time. A person whom we are familiar with was also present with CEO Kim. The chairman inquired about CEO Kim's player and requested him to stop keeping the player hidden. CE Kim insisted that he wasn't hiding his player and mentioned that the chairman would be surprised if he found out. Back in Susie's room, she was on top of Dagon. To his surprise, Susie displayed better skills than he had anticipated. As Susie pinned Dagon down, our protagonist could feel her melons, I mean strength. Attempting another move, Susie was taken aback when Dagon easily blocked it, revealing unexpected skills. Believing Dagon lacked jujitsu knowledge, Susie found herself quickly flipped, with Dagon now holding her wrists. He managed to handcuff her, leading to Susie's protests of cheating. Unfazed, Dagon sought a blanket, leaving Susie puzzled about its purpose. Assuming things might take a steamy turn, Susie soon found herself in darkness as Dagon covered her with the blanket, limiting her vision out of necessity. Leaving Susie's room and the house, Dagon appeared visibly sweaty from the intense workout. Unbeknownst to him, someone took a photo of him. Samuel, noticing Dagon's sweat, speculated that something might have happened. Shortly after, Sunjin received a message revealing a photo of Dagon carrying Susie to her house. Intrigued, Soyev checked the photo and Sunjin advised caution as it came from an unknown sender. However, another photo sent showed Dagon coming out of the house, still sweaty. Sunjin suggested investigating, but Suyok, being an overprotective brother, 
crushed the phone in his grip and insisted on an immediate investigation. Susie, on the other hand, got out of bed and searched for Dagon. However, Dagon had already gone outside. Susie wished he had stayed longer. She then heard the bed creaking. Meanwhile, Heejin received a report that Suyuk's game had started. A referee introduced a fighter named Magma. Heejin promptly joined CEO Kim. The referee then introduced the Coliseum's beast. CEO Park confirmed with the chairman that it would be his player. The audience cheered for the Lion King as he entered the arena. Magma didn't take the title seriously, but he soon realized he was facing a massive beast. The image then changed to Suyok. The referee noticed Suyok's distraction and instructed him to stand in front of the other player. Sunjin observed that Suyok was distracted because of Suzy. Understanding how he could be distracted after seeing the photo, Sunjin, being confident as an Aran boy, decided to investigate everything and left. Before the match officially started, the referee began stating some precautions, but Magma ignored him and went after Suyok. Heejin noticed Magma's speed, but Suyok was his opponent. People were surprised when Magma managed to land a hit on Suyok. Magma continued attacking, and Suyok didn't defend himself, just taking the punches. CEO Park observed that the chairman's player wasn't in good shape. Heejin insisted that Suyok wouldn't normally allow himself to be hit so easily. It became clear that Suyok couldn't focus on the fight. Magma told Suyok to block properly, but Suyok remained passive. Magma stopped, realizing something was off, and asked the referee about Suyok's condition. Seeing Suyok not fighting properly, Magma took matters into his own hands and grabbed Suyok's head, questioning if he was just there to be a punching bag. Magma mentioned his experience in battles across the country, expressing boredom with Suyok not fighting back. Suddenly, Suyok retaliated by striking Magma's abdomen. Magma fell to the ground, blood flowing from his mouth. The chairman began telling a story from the old Roman Empire where people were made to fight against lions. It was like a dangerous game where risking one's life was the norm. He turned to CEO Park and asked who would win in a face-off between a human and a lion. Magma picked himself up and admitted he had let his guard down. He was relieved that Suyok had chosen to fight seriously and came charging at him. However, Suyok countered by delivering a strong punch to Magma's arm, breaking his bone and overpowering him. Following that, Suheo came for a body blow, breaking Magma's ribs. Magma, coughing up blood, knelt on the floor and started pleading for mercy, covering his face with his left hand. Unmoved, Suayuk smashed Magma's hand and nose simultaneously. Magma, taken aback, continued to beg, but Suyok wasn't finished and delivered a powerful punch, sending Magma flying. The chairman explained that in the Roman times, humans stood no chance against lions. The audience wasn't there to witness human battles. They were there to see the lion enjoy its meal. So Ayok had attempted to talk to Magma, but he goofed up his name. Remembering Magma's earlier question about why he was in the arena, So Ayok explained that he had a cute younger sister for whom he was willing to do anything. He then reminded Magma of his own determination to fight to the death. Even if armed, a gladiator stood little chance against a beast like the lion. Magma began begging for his life, desperately trying to call for the referee's assistance. However, the referee remained silent, glaring at him. Magma pleaded for mercy and offered a sum of money. Suayuk seized Magma's leg, stating that mercy was out of the question. He argued that he could earn more money if the fight ended in a knockout, and with the prize money, he could buy delicious food for his sister, Susie. The following day, Manho and his friends searched for Dagun. They found a long line of students inside their classroom supervised by the nerd. The students were there to pay their visits and offer respects to the king. The line was leading towards Dagon's seat, and the others realized this. Meanwhile, Dagon was frustrated because he couldn't study well due to the commotion. He told everyone to go away. Suddenly, students whom Dagon had defeated earlier tried to cut in line to talk to him. As they discussed money matters, a girl appeared and pushed other students aside. The blonde bully was kicked in the face and fell to the ground. Susie intervened, instructing them not to bother the king. The blonde bully got angry at Susie, but Jinmo grabbed him and declared that it was his role to be kicked around by Susie. Susie then asked Dagun to pay attention to her, but he ignored her. She grabbed Dagun's collar, and he complained that he couldn't study in peace. Susie blushed intensely, finding Dagun's annoyed face handsome. Dagun was puzzled, and Susie explained that he had been too aggressive the previous night, breaking her bed. 
Everyone around them was shocked by Susie's revelation. She shyly asked Dagon to take responsibility, making our boy break into a cold sweat. Jiseok felt flustered, and Manho nodded in agreement. Dagon instructed Susie to express herself correctly. Shyly, Susie asked him again to take responsibility. Dagon attempted to explain that it was due to her jujitsu skills, but someone abruptly slammed their desk. It was Sun Jin trying to calm himself. He couldn't believe Susie had grown into a lady. Suddenly, memories of Susie from 10 years ago, when she was just a cute little sister, flashed in his mind. Now she acted like a queen and could beat up Sun Jin. Trying to calm himself, he thought of justifying the situation with a rebellion. Dagon noticed Sun Jin leaving, but Susie wondered what he was looking at. Dagon didn't recognize Sun Jin from their class. Susie kept shaking Dagon, who was fixated on the unfamiliar face. Susie exclaimed that it was from Dagon's class, but someone said he was not. Sung Hoon appeared and saw everyone. He asked them for an emergency meeting, excluding Susie. Later at the gym storage, he explained that the student was Sun Jin from the third grade. He said that the third graders had already started moving. They were scared because someone had casually sat down in their class without anyone noticing. Sung Hoon mentioned that Sun Jin had a unique lack of presence and was Baek Suyok's errand boy. Sun Jin came to spy on Da Gun, and since he was moving around, it meant the third graders were getting ready to make a move. Specifically, So Ayuk and his executives named the four heavenly kings. Others thought the third graders were childish for calling themselves such titles. Jong and assumed things would be quick since there were only five people to fight. Sung Hoon warned them not to underestimate their low numbers. He reminded them that Jim Ryong High controlled the region, and So Ayuk and his executives were in charge. The four executives were far superior to the weaker second graders. Out of the blue, Dagon wondered when the midterm exams were. Sung Hoon said they were in three weeks. Dagon said he needed to study for midterms and asked Sung Hoon to invite four or even forty people to end things quickly. Surprised that Dagon was serious about studying, Sung Hoon offered his notes. Dagon was shocked that Sung Hoon was letting him borrow such precious things and exclaimed that he wanted to beat up the remaining bullies quickly. Sung Hoon also desired that outcome, but they still didn't know what the third graders were doing or how things would turn out. Meanwhile, Sun Jin couldn't help but curse as the executives left him on read in the group chat. He didn't want to inform City Oak about what he had heard and planned to solve things on his own. At a cram school, students from Jumryong High poured out of the exit. A student with glasses and a large build quietly passed by the others, walking off alone. He passed some teenagers who were smoking and complaining about not making enough money. They noticed the large student with glasses and called them over. Despite his size, he was treated as a pushover because the students in the neighborhood were generally weak. The large student then observed a schoolmate being extorted. The bully began slapping the large student for ignoring him. The large student calmly grabbed the bully's arm and twisted it. He also punched the bully in the neck, causing him to fall to the ground. The bullies who were left attempted to boast about their identity, but the large student recognized them as Hanwol High students. He wondered why they had come so far. The leader of the group then instructed everyone to attack the large student and retreat afterward. Three of them rushed towards the big student, but he effortlessly avoided all their attacks. After a while, he began to fight back with powerful punches and easily defeated the bullies. The leader then instructed his girlfriend to step back and pulled out a short knife. He attacked with the knife, but the large student casually dodged the attempt. Disarming the leader, he delivered a sharp elbow to the abdomen and finished the confrontation with a neck twist leaving the leader unconscious on the ground. Trembling, the girl threatened to report the incident, claiming she had recorded everything. However, in a single swift strike, the large student knocked her out. The big student had grabbed the phone and erased the photo. Then he asked the student who was hiding to come out. Sun Jin emerged quietly, like a ninja, and the big student wondered why he was there. Sun Jin, puzzled by the lack of response in the chat, inquired the same. He couldn't believe that one of the heavenly kings was attending cram school. The big student turned out to be Han Namba, a third grader and one of the heavenly kings. He advised Sun Jin to keep it short. Sun Jin, temporarily setting aside his attitude, informed Namba about Da Gun, who had already defeated the first and second graders in Jumryong High. Since Suyuk was absent, Sun Jin took on the leader role and instructed Namba to handle Da Gun. However, Namba refused, not wanting to deal with the thing. Sun Jin was surprised that he referred to a school matter as a simple thing. Namba warned Sun Jin that he didn't want to use the pencil case on him and suggested finding someone else. 
Sun Jin, angered, left, stating he wouldn't forget Nambei's refusal. Sun Jin had hoped for Nambei's help, but now he faced a problem, the remaining three uncontrollable beasts. It got pretty intense, so he thought about reaching out to one of them. In a quiet spot, a phone lit up with a notification, and there were folks having a scuffle in the background. As one person's face got pushed to the floor, the aggressor realized someone was trying to call him. He answered the call and wondered why he was being bothered. He asked Sunjin to cut to the chase, skip the explanation, and just give the name and class number. An Hagen couldn't guarantee how hard he might punch Dagon. The day after, the usual duo, Jongmin and Hojeng, headed to the cafeteria. Other students made way for them, even the third graders. Nearby girls were surprised that Jongmin and Hojeng cut in line, but one girl insisted that the boys made way themselves. She explained that it was because of a first grader named Quan Dagon. He was known for being good looking, impolite, and unkind. The girls started giggling about Dagon, and some boys speculated about Dagon and Suzy getting together. They praised Suzy for her boldness and wondered how Dagon managed to stay alive, given her protective brother. Sunjin overheard them and remembered how he had mentioned this to the other executives, but they found him ridiculous, so he decided to take action. Later in class one-to-one, Sung Hoon shared with his friends that there used to be another strong third grader besides the Heavenly Kings. He remembered the student's name as Chunsum. Ho Jung and Jongmin got curious because the name sounded strange. Man Ho, our no manner fighter, scolded them for making fun of others' names. Dagon was puzzled, but Sung Hoon insisted he was just passing on information. Meanwhile, in class three to one, some third graders were upset about the unruly behavior of first graders and sought help. The girls thought their male classmates were silly for asking for help, but the boys believed the girls were drawn to Dagon because of his good looks. They dismissed the girls and informed a male classmate that Suyuk and the Heavenly Kings were not doing anything about the situation. The boys could only rely on Chunsum, who seemed like a big fat kid based on what they could see from behind. Chunsum had wondered if Dagon was truly good looking, and the boys said he was a bit dandy. Just as Chunsum told them to leave, Sunjin opened the door and asked for Chunsum's help. He talked about Dagon, and Chunsum complained about hearing Dagon's name all day. Oh Chunsum, another powerful third grader, wondered just who Dagon was. The fat kid then asked if Chunsum was finished with her makeup practice. Chunsum admitted she failed and told the hefty kid to wash his face. Chunsum then told Sunjin to speak. Sunjin began narrating about Dagon, but the new girl was busy playing with her phone. After finishing the game, she questioned why Sunjin didn't just tell Suyuk instead. Sunjin explained that Suyuk was busy, and Chunsun wondered if it was the same with the Heavenly Kings. She couldn't believe what was happening and decided to scold Dagon on her own. Meanwhile, in the cafeteria, Dagon ate his lunch while Manho suggested addressing the issue with someone named Chunsun. Dagon's instincts signaled that Chunsun was dangerous, known for controlling the four Heavenly Kings. Suddenly, Chunsum appeared behind Dagon, who was talking in a silly manner about her. Dagon noticed her, and Chunsum wanted to confirm if he was indeed Dagon. She introduced herself and instructed Dagon to follow her. For a moment, Dagon and the boys fell silent, since they assumed Chunsum was a guy. Chunsum scolded them for ignoring her. Eventually, Dagon stood up and decided to follow her. Blushing, Chunsum realized how tall Dagon was. Outside, Chita confirmed that Dagon was a rude talker because he spoke to a senior without honorifics. The little girl didn't know that Dagon was already 20. When Chunsum started scolding him, Dagon found her bossy for her size. Chunsum then realized that Dagon was ignoring her words and attempted to punch him. However, she hesitated before lightly punching Dagon. She insisted it was a real hit, but Dagon questioned if it even counted as a punch. Chunsum continued scolding Dagon for his recent actions, but all he could see was a cute chihuahua in front of him. Chunsum then pretended to have a headache and tried to leave. Dagon, however, stopped her by grabbing her small arm. He insisted that he hadn't been scolded enough and wanted to talk more. Flustered, Chunsum claimed she wasn't into younger guys. Knowing that Chunsum had connections with the four heavenly kings, Dagon asked her to bring them out. At that moment, someone came looking for Dagon. Dagon was curious about the person's identity, but we all recognized him by his tracksuit and bald head. Sun Hua, having learned from his past mistakes, believed that regular techniques wouldn't work. More PE students joined and Sun Hua mentioned he had a powerful move ready. 
The PE students lined up behind Sungwa, who charged towards Daegun. They all hit his back, giving him momentum. Sunhua attempted a flying drop kick, but Daegun, holding Chunsum, sidestepped. Sunghua missed, and Daegun readied a Gwyn light punch. Realizing his mistake, Sunghua ended up with his face on the floor after Daegun's strike. Meanwhile, Chunsum, who had been thrown to the side, injured her ankle. Sunjin watched the unfolding scene in front of him. Daegun extended a hand to Chunsum while apologizing. Chunsum insisted that it wasn't Daegun's fault. Sunjin rushed toward her and offered to take her to the medical room. He then glared at Daegun, who quickly recognized him. Sunjin and Chunsum then escaped. On the other hand, Sunhua realized that pro wrestling moves were ineffective against Daegun. Daegun blamed Sunhua for the situation and ordered him to get up. Knowing that Sunhua was now awake, he also instructed the rest of the PE class to lower their heads to the ground. Little did Daegun know, Hagen had been watching everything. A teacher then approached as he had received a report about someone suspicious lurking around. However, upon recognizing Hagen, he scolded him for being absent for a long time. Suddenly, the teacher was interrupted and found himself sitting on the ground. He couldn't believe that Hagen had raised his hands against a teacher. That night, Daegun walked back home and blamed Sung Hwa for wasting his time. He was about to reprimand them, but Sung Hwa began talking about the Heavenly Kings. However, Sung Hoon interrupted since he was sharing his notes with Daegun. Daegun told Sung Hwa to inform him later, finding him annoying for coming up with weird techniques. Just then, he noticed a street mirror and realized that he needed to get a new haircut. Suddenly, he noticed someone coming from behind. Hagen swiftly threw a punch, but Daegun dodged it. Daegun stepped back and asked for his attacker's identity. With an annoying expression, Hagen wondered if Daegun knew about him. Preparing to fight, Daegun knew Hagen wouldn't talk. Hagen shrugged and claimed that he didn't mean it that way. He said there was nothing good from knowing and went for a kicking attack. Daegun dodged, but Hagen continued his kicks. Seeing his skills, Daegun assumed that Hagen was one of the heavenly kings. While Hagen counted his kicks, Daegun wondered if Hagen had been a student since he wasn't wearing a uniform. He had been ordered not to attack civilians, but he could feel a heavy murdering intent from Hagen. Daegun then found a chance and threw a punch. After finishing school, Sung Hoon came outside and found Sung Hwa and his friends still there. He was curious about what they were up to, and Sung Hwa explained they were being punished. Sung Hwa mentioned they hadn't been told to go home yet, and Sung Hoon remembered Daegun punishing them earlier while discussing something. Sung Hoon then wondered why Sung Hwa was the only one still standing and questioned if Daegun let him off because he was a captain. Sung Hwa clarified that standing still was his punishment and expressed envy for those on the ground as they were working on their core strength while being punished. Sung Hwa suggested doing squats. Sun Boon, another person in the group, asked what Sung Hwa discussed with Daegun. Sung Hwa said it was about the four heavenly kings and asked Sung Hoon if he wanted to hear about it. Despite others complaining about the extra time it would take, Sung Hwa ignored them and started talking about the four heavenly kings. As he spoke about their history, the other PE students left one by one. Sung Hwa then mentioned a rumor he'd heard that the Heavenly Kings were called brutal instead of strong. To his surprise, he discovered that the rumor was true. He proceeded to recount a story from the past when the PE class practiced randomly in a construction site, focusing on Sodok, the second in command. Hagen, a senior, approached them and observed what seemed like an underground fight imitation. Sung Hwa introduced Hagen, and instead of showing respect, Hagen teased the PE class members, questioning if they were playing house. He inquired about the strongest member, and although Sun Hwa attempted to step forward, Sodok stopped him. Introducing himself, Sodok caught Hagen's attention and Hagen, intrigued by his name, walked towards Sodok, showing no intention of respecting a senior. Haddock, another member, called them cute and claimed to demonstrate a real underground fight. Despite Sung Hwa's attempt to interfere, he was stopped by another member. Sodok assumed a fighting stance, and Hagen perceived it as aggressive. Sodok surprised everyone with a punch, displaying his skill as a southpaw boxer. However, Hagen, with his evasive moves, dodged every punch effortlessly, resembling a slippery snake. Hagen remained calm, irritating Sodok, who continued his punches, but Hagen skillfully avoided them all. Observing Hagen's flabby movements, Sung Hwa wondered if it was a factor aiding his dodging or a point of ridicule. Upset, Sodok kept trying to hit Hagen, but none of his punches landed. 
Suddenly, Hagen spotted Sodok throwing a hook. He seized the opportunity to counter like a snake, coiling his arm around Sodok's and grabbing his shoulder. Sodok cried out in pain, surprising the onlookers. Sarcastically, Hagen apologized for dislocating Sodok's shoulder and suggested switching from South Pav to Orthodox. Teasingly, he urged Sodok not to give up, as the fight wasn't finished. Sung Hwai intervened, proposing to end the fight before more injuries occurred. Ignoring him, Hagen moved towards the still pained Sodok. Sung Hwa, attempting to stop Hagen, charged at him but found himself caught. Suddenly, Hagen was choking Sung Hwa from behind, threatening to bite off his left ear. The other P-class members tried to intervene, but Hagen warned them to stay put. He criticized them as foolish for not helping the struggling Sun Hwa. Eventually, Sun Hwa lost consciousness, and when he woke up, his teammates were sprawled on the floor. It was the moment he crossed paths with one of the four heavenly kings. That's Sun Hwa's memory during squats. Sun Hoon wondered why Sun Hwa, who was always into gathering information, shared details with Daegun. Sun Hwa said that before Daegun defeated them, he thought they were constantly struggling. Strangely, their pain disappeared the next day. He insisted he just wanted to study with no other motives. Sung Hoon could see Sung Hwa's desire to support Da Gun. However, Sung Hwa kept talking about titles until Sung Hoon interrupted him. Sung Hwa brought up Hagen's name, describing him as brutal and strong. Sung Hwa emphasized that even Da Gun would find it tough. Now back in the dimly lit street, we see Da Gun tapping his arm, questioning a battered Hagen about his intentions. Day Gun stated that things couldn't remain as they were and demanded to know who and what Hagen was. He wanted answers while Hagen's mouth was still working. Day Gun threatened to crush Hagen's mouth if he didn't speak up soon. Meanwhile, Sunjin had just received a message from Hagen, who had set his sights on Day Gun. Recognizing the area in the photo, Sunjin quickly headed out. Sung Hoon noticed his urgency and sensed that something was amiss. Sung Hwa, curious about the situation, asked Sung Hoon what was happening and he instructed Sung Hwa to follow him. At the same time, Hagen found Dae Gun intriguing and began questioning him. Encountering an unexpected resistance, Hagen wondered if Dae Gun was truly a first grader as he didn't appear to be one. Dae Gun realized that Hagen doubted his age, not the project. Recollecting the existence of four formidable 16-year-old students like Mike Tyson, he contemplated whether he could claim a similar title. Disregarding Hagen's inquiry, Dae Gun decided to finish things swiftly. Hagen attempted another attack, realizing something about Da Gun's eyes, but suddenly he felt the force hit his chest like a gunshot. He crumpled to the ground. Da Gun, puzzled, wondered about Hagen's unfinished words. Sun Jin arrived to find Da Gun standing and Hagen on the ground. Sun Hoon and Sun Hwa also joined them, surprised to see one of the Heavenly Kings unconscious. Meanwhile, Shun Sim let off steam at an arcade to relieve her stress. She remembered the rude encounter with Da Gun, which had caught her interest. She remarked on Sun Jin's childish behavior for bringing in the formidable Heavenly Kings just to scold the first grader, despite the group's intimidating reputation. Surprisingly, one of the members of this fearsome group now lay unconscious before Da Gun, who was taken aback by the mysterious attacker's identity. Da Gun attempted to wake up Hagen, but the latter attacked swiftly, grabbing Da Gun's arm and aiming for his neck with the other hand. Dagon, however, managed to counter by grabbing Hayden's snake-like arm and throwing him away. Hagen, impressed, teased Dagon about his awakening, mentioning the slow-acting drug. Sunjin, frustrated, scolded Hagen, but he warned Sunjin to be careful with his words, as the drug could be deadly. Sunjin speculated if Hagen had taken a drug called mud. Hagen insisted that Dagon was not an ordinary first grader and likened himself to a banquet rather than a school cafeteria lunch. Sun Jin then instructed Hagen to ensure Da Gun's defeat, urging Sung Hoon and Sung Hwa to witness it. Sun Jin declared they would be crushed for their rebellion and confidently predicted Da Gun's imminent demise. Realizing drugs were involved, Da Gun observed that Hagen was in his zone, but he sensed something unusual. Suddenly, Hagen's demeanor shifted, and he attacked Da Gun. Ignoring Hagen's zone, Da Gun easily dodged and tried to counter with a surprise uppercut. Surprisingly, Hagen evaded and smirked as he twisted his arm around Dagun's. Despite Dagun throwing a right hook, Hagen used a snake-like technique, a move Sung Hwa recognized as the one that dislocated Sodok's shoulder. The technique involved intertwining arms and applying pressure on the opponent's shoulder. However, the move wasn't fully executed as a fist suddenly came at Hagen. 
he narrowly dodged it, throwing himself backward in disbelief that his technique didn't work. He hadn't expected to fail while under the influence of drugs, questioning if Dagon's dynamic visuals and reactions surpassed his own. Meanwhile, Sun Guan noticed that Hagen wasn't aiming for victory, but to incapacitate Dagon, which wasn't working. Sun Jin laughed, calling them ignorant and teasing whether to reveal the technique. Sun Hua, obsessed with information, grew frustrated and impatient. Sun Jin recognized that the current Hagen exceeded the limits of a normal person. In his explanation, Sun Jin referred to it as the immersion zone, also known as hyperfocus, a state where a person utilizes their brain's full potential, enhancing both mental and physical abilities. When in the zone, one perceives everything in a slowed manner, easily finding opportunities to attack, as Hagen was doing. Dagon managed to stop Hagen's right arm, but Hagen's left arm wrapped around Dagon's right arm. Despite Hagen thinking he had Dagon, the latter fought back, surprising Hagen. Hagen continued targeting Dagon's neck, but Dagon's punch caused him to miss. Deciding to focus on the arm, Hagen was thrown off with one swing from Dagon. Dagon claimed Hagen was more annoying than Sun Hua, noting Hagen's new movements and wondering if he was in the immersion zone. Hagen was impressed that Dagon knew, while Sun Hoon and Sun Hua remained clueless. Sun Jin was surprised that a first grader knew about the immersion zone. Dagon was impressed to encounter someone consciously using the zone. However, he halted mid-sentence, recalling the drug and expressing complexity about what to say. Deciding to get serious, Dagon wanted to find out if the drug-driven zone was comparable to the real one. That's it for today's recap. Give us a like and subscribe to see more manual recaps. See you next time.